everyone, meet Erin Fairsfield. She is a wonderful developer at Oracle, doing amazing and brilliant things. Um, joined us at the beginning of the year, and yeah, she's got a very interesting talk. It's going to be very cool. So thank you all for joining me for this morning's talk about uh, my team's project, Sherlock, which is a fleet diagnostics tool for you know, assessing fleet health at scale. So a few introductions. Um, Oracle is a evil galactic empire. I mean, sorry, we're a global software corporate company. Um, software development company, software corporate company. Uh, we've got our fingers in a lot of different pies. We do databases, we do programming languages. Um, you name it, we probably either do it or we buy it or bought it or whatever, including the cloud, which is where I come from. So, as uh, Peter mentioned, my name is Erin Fashvelt. I joined Oracle at the beginning of this year. And in a, roughly March, I joined the fleet diagnostics team, Sherlock. Um, and it's been a really great place to learn a lot about Python. Um, you know, coming from a university background, um, you kind of, you don't really appreciate all these handy features that a language offers you when you're operating at scale in production. Um, and the team has been a really great place to, to learn about that kind of thing. So who are we? What do we do? We're the in-house uh, framework for running Python diagnostics at regular intervals on uh, the DOM zeros of admin and guest nodes to detect known issues. Um, this can range from anything from CPU usage to like DNS tables being out of date. So in, essentially, we are this guy. Uh, sorry, I mean this guy. Um, so some of you might be asking yourselves, what is a d diagnostics framework? Essentially, it's a piece of architecture that allows you to run scripts at regular intervals. The scripts themselves are designed to detect known issues. Um, there are a number of features that you want out of a diagnostics framework. Um, first of all, you want it to run in kind of this observation-only mode. You don't want to kind of um, good, good scientific principles. You don't want to impact the thing you're measuring by measuring it. Um, so to use the example from earlier, you don't want CPU usage to go up like 40% when you're trying to check out how much CPU your current processes are, are using. Um, just like any other service you run, you need it to be robust. But if anything, you need it to be more robust than anything else you run. Because when everything else is crashing and burning, you need to be able to look at your diagnostics and um, work out what's wrong, why is it wrong. <coughs> Um, and particularly, how do I go about fixing it? So being able to scale this out is really important for you as your business grows, or in our context, as you operate at an already large scale. Um, and as with um, any scientific endeavor, it's really important for the, your results to be really accurate. It's no good, everything relying on the database is showing up red, it's breaking but your diagnostic that assesses database health is saying, oh no, everything's fine. <laughs> um, because then you're gonna spend far too long trying to work out what's wrong when the answer was right in front of you the entire time. Following on from this, you want your, your framework to tell you when something is wrong. Um, it's, you, it's really embarrassing when your client has to come to you and be like, yo, nothing's working. Um, and you then have to go and find out why is nothing working? Um, and hopefully, because these are scripts to detect known issues, by extension, they should hopefully be able to resolve those issues. So in the interest of trying to kind of keep this Python focused, I mean, you can see from the um, diagram on the side, we use a lot of different pieces of tech to make all of this happen. But I'm just going to focus on these three points, observation only, scale, and accuracy, in terms of how we actually leverage Python to make all this possible. Um, you're here for Python, you're not here for Java, so we can ignore that stuff. Quick overview. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, context into our production environment. 
um, then run you through an overview of our framework before looking at how we've used Python to package things, operate at scale, and make it really easy to use, or make our framework really easy to use so that um, we can get those three properties that I mentioned earlier. Cool. Um, so the subtitle of this talk mentions a restricted environment, and um, that's really our production cloud environment at Oracle. So your kind of single, um, your base unit in, that, in our cloud is a single node, where we have customer VMs running on Zen, um, and all sorts of handy pieces of software to manage those instant life cycles, to manage the data, etc. Um, those single nodes get bundled up into a cluster, which then in turn gets bundled up into a series of clusters called a site. All the clusters are more or less the same, except with the exception of one admin cluster, which is responsible for managing all the clusters. Clusters themselves get um, uh, extrapolated further up into regions, which gives us a real-world look at things. Um, some of you might have been at ScaleConf this year and recognized this slide. I stole it from that. <laughs> Um, so we have like our Oracle databases, oh sorry, our Oracle data centers, and then every now and again we have a cloud at customer installation where we've gone and installed our cloud product at a customer's uh, cloud cloud site, um, or at, yeah, at a customer's location. And in the real world, all sorts of things happen: uh, bugs get released, <laughs> aliens invade, beam down T-Rex overlords set of massive explosions, and then, of course, mundane power outages and hardware failures. Um, so this brings to light a couple of scenarios which um, we've had to face that really brought, it, brought to light why it was necessary to have a diagnostics framework. Um, running into all sorts of networking issues um, and having to debug these when they're affecting customers um, storage issues, you know, um, having difficulty attaching storage d um, devices to running instances. Um, some of you might recognize the word uh, Spectre and Meltdown, and that kind of ties into the Zen mitigations. Um, we needed a way to quickly and easily look at our fleet and see where have we not patched things um, and, um, you know, is, is, this, is this site still vulnerable to Spectre, um, Spectre vulnerabilities, or has it been patched, essentially? And things like database failures, um, those, those are really fun. Um, another question you guys might be asking yourselves, though, is why have we built our own diagnostics tool? Um, why did we not follow the logical step of using an existing solution like Elasticsearch Beats, um, and why instead did we go through all the effort of creating our own thing? Well, our production environment has a number of implications for us. Um, yes, we still use Python 2.6. Um, we've got to be very sensitive with our database load. We can't just be like shoving masses of massive metrics through. Um, and there are all sorts of dependencies, uh, you know, Older versions of uh, yeah, older versions of packages that are being used in production that we don't, you know, we might want to use a newer version of it, and we can't mess with that kind of shit. There are also interesting legal restrictions that are coming up in light of the new data laws that are coming out in Europe. We're a global company; we've got to bear those kinds of things in mind. So, like pharmaceutical companies being concerned about release, like hosting their data, they can't host their data outside of their own cloud. And we've got to be able to go into their cloud and operate within their restrictions. Cool. So, everyone with me so far? <laughs> Great. Um, so, next, just a quick little overview of our um, framework. For the purpose of this talk, we're pretty much going to focus on that portion of the um, of the diagram. The rest of this, I mean, Python does come into our front end a bit, but 
that's where the real interesting magic happens in terms of providing us with this really great frame, uh, framework. Um, and if you have a look here, you'll notice C groups being part of the um, sandbox that we set up in, on our guest nodes and DOM zeros. And that is really crucial for the observation only point. We use C groups to limit the memory footprint of our services to 200 megabytes and 30 discrites per second. Um, and that kind of prevents it from going rogue and taking over all the resources available on the site so that, um, and like, you know, taking down services that our customers depend on. Uh, we also use Python's multiprocessing to limit, restrict us, uh, restrict the number of CPU threads that we run at every, any given time. Most of the time we're only using one um, and very occasionally we use two. So that means we can operate at scale while maintaining this kind of observation-only level of impact. While the scripts themselves are running within the sandbox, um, the collector, this bit here, um, actually, I should have brought a, a laser. My cat might have been upset with me, though. Um, there's a mouse pointer. Uh, yeah, I don't think I can use the mouse pointer in like the, yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, so um, ultimately the collector is responsible, <coughs> sorry, for um, working out the schedule at which we run our diagnostics. So, oh, oh, there's a laser. <gasps> Magic, wait, how does it work? Cool, push the button, it works, yay. So, collector, yes. Um, and that helps us ensure that our diagnostics aren't all running at the same time across different nodes. So, I mentioned networking earlier, you might wanna do something like work out how long it's taking you to reach a given server, but you're running on a site with 20,000 nodes. You don't want 20,000 like pings or trace routes going through trying to like uh, all at the same time and you know dosing yourself essentially um, so you want to kind of stagger out your uh, the intervals at which your diagnostics run and that's something that um, our collector does for us um, and then as and then following on from that the results oh wait wait there the results um, get I'll put it to the RAM disk, and that's fine, it's not Python, but that's really important for us in terms of making sure that our service is still available when, you know, when we have hardware failures. Um, so if the hard drives go down, we can still pull out our results because they're just stored in RAM disk, they're not st stored on the hard disks. The publisher then publishes the um, results up to the admin DOM zeros, and the diagnostic service, which as you can see is written in Java, so I'm gonna leave that out, but please feel free to ask questions about it after this. Um, and then our CLI ensures that we can, like when everything is crashing and burning and our, the aliens have invaded and beamed down our T-Rex overlords, we can still get results from those. We can SSH onto a node, run, a diagnostic and see what the result is. Cool, so some more interesting Python stuff. So I mentioned this sandbox earlier and um, something that we do a really cool thing. Yeah. Take a moment to appreciate the Harry Potter jokes. <laughs> um, so so all of us here have at some point used this phrase with do this thing within this context. And you kind of just take for granted that it works and it does this cool stuff. Um, but what's going on in the background is essentially um, Python has a, what's it, a context manager protocol. Um, and essentially you um, it evaluates whatever is returned here, 
And if it defines an enter or exit method, it executes everything in here within that context. So the way we use it is to extend our module paths so that those dependencies that are, um, uh, exist in production, like Python 2.6, and like, uh, dip, like older versions of packages, don't affect us. It also allows us to extend our system functionality. So, um, you know, your base uh, logging module can be extended to in all sorts of fun and interesting ways. So, this is how we set up our um, import paths. This is specifically for when we are running our diagnostics. So, um, for example, we use a later version of PSUtils that then is available in production. Um, and so, when we do this, we can, uh, we are running with, it's pointing towards the version of PSUtils that we want to use, not the version that's available to everything else in the system. And that also really, it helps keep us separated from um, like the entire production context and makes this, uh, this framework really transferable. Um, and this is just an example of how we've extended our system uh, modules. Uh, we use a different log handler to the one that is available by default in, um, in, the, in the logging module. And, sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, you as a developer, don't, when you're coming in and writing your own diagnostic, you don't have to worry about that. We handle it. Um, it makes the rest of our framework cleaner in terms of then being able to go and consume those logs. And you as a developer, as a non-Sherlock developer, should I say, um, don't have to worry about any of that kind of thing. Cool. Um, operating at scale. The main principle that we've um, followed here is to keep our diagnostics short and sweet. Um, I've mentioned a bit how, about how we use C groups to, um, to limit our memory footprint and our disk writes, etc. But then the diagnostics th themselves are really easy to configure to, um, for example, the restrictions we can um, restrict a diagnostic to run only on admin nodes or only on DOM zeros. We can tell it to run on a site or on, like across a site or on an individual node or on a, an entire cluster. And so that helps us to um, kind of scale out the running of these things. We're not running diagnostics everywhere unnecessarily. They get run where they need to as they need to. The collector then um, buckets the timing of the um, diagnostic scripts. Everything has, it's, uh, I mentioned how it schedules things. Those schedule, that schedule then gets to divided up into five minute buckets. And if things can't finish operating within that five minute bucket, they get timed out. And we pick that up um, further down the line. And then of course, as I mentioned, the RAM disk means that when things are burning, we can, we can still access those results. So this is just an example um, diagnostic um, that, we, um, that we, we run. And the kind of takeaway I want you to have from here is really this idea that, for example, there's no use in having like a site level diagnostic that's you know, gonna run once to try and work out how much free memory you have on a node. I mean, then it's, that single node is going to be SSHing to all your other nodes and like having to execute this, whereas instead, um, we tell it to run this on every single node within this site and it can just, yeah, it's a much simpler, much cleaner process to, um, to run and to manage. Um, okay, this is, should say ease of use, sorry, I didn't proofread my slides. Um, and it's probably a little bit cheeky of me to claim that um, by 
increasing the ease of use of our framework, we're increasing the accuracy of our diagnostics, and hence Python is responsible for it. But it is a little bit like that, because essentially we don't, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I, I work on Sherlock, I don't work on another team's product, but we want Sherlock to be used to assess their product. Um, so you want that product expert to come in and write a diagnostic that evaluates that health. And it's really important to make it really easy for those other developers to just come in, drop down, and, um, and write a diagnostic. So that's something that Python has been really good at in terms of yeah, making, it, um, making it easy for other developers to come in and extend our framework. Um, it's also all running in a sandbox container, um, one that can be um, mimicked on your dev machine. So someone in the States who has no experience with us can just download our, you know, our repo, run make develop, and end up with a simulated environment that they can, comp they can uh, test out and develop a... Um, a diagnostic within. It's also completely decoupled from our production environment, which means that, you know, person from team A has no clue what person from team B is doing, and they don't need to know what product person from team B is doing, because even though, you know, that might matter in terms of how their, uh, sis the systems interact in production, they can just evaluate their like product's health, completely devoid of um, understanding of the other team's uh, product. Um, another really important point here is that it's, we've set up a um, continuous, not really continuous integration, but we've set up a build system that makes it really easy for us to deploy rapidly to um, test sites, which is really like fulfilling for you as a developer because you don't want to you know, wait around for your things to make it all the way into production before you see how they are useful and what the results look like. Um, you can just submit a build, it goes through, and voila, your results are there. Maybe that's just important for us in like this corporate context, but you know, it feels really cool. Um, great. So, yeah. Um, this is probably the more important of these slides, just showing how easy it is for you to come in and um, configure one of these things. All you as a developer really need to wor worry about is this diagnose method. Everything else in terms of you know, the human readability of the health, it's very clear um, how you should be using um, the health, how you should be using your tags, um, how to ske like schedule the regularity at which your um, frequency with which your um, diagnostic runs and the level at which your diagnostic should run. And just as kind of like a, to prove my point, as it were, about how easy it is for us to, uh, for people to come in and extend this, uh, write their own diagnostics. For any of you who were at ScaleCon for the beginning of this year, this would have been the list of diagnostics that um, Anton showed you as part of his presentation. And this is where we are now. I think there are 138 in total now, and there were only like, what's that, 20 maybe? Earlier in the year. It's yeah, very satisfying when people start, start using your things. But ultimately, the proof is in the pudding. Um, I mentioned all of these scenarios earlier in terms of issues that we've faced and um, yeah, we've, um, yeah, previously you'd get woken up on a Saturday morning when you really don't want page duty to go off um, and you'd have to worry about what's broken now. Whereas now you can just look at our dashboard, the health of a given site is readily understandable um, and readily consumable and you can quickly and easily see when things are broken. Um, we really like the green stuff, we don't like it when it shows red. 
Red's a horrible color. <laughs> Sorry. Unless it's, unless it's on our branding, of course. Um, <laughs> cool. So, um, that's it from me. Um, I'd like to like, leave as much time as possible for questions. So, any questions you guys have, please ask. Put up your hand if you have any questions. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering what yeah. are you using? I mean, f uh, the ELK for what are you storing the ELK? Sorry, what are we? Elastic Sage. Oh, Elastic yeah. Sage and Kivan. What I'm asking is that what are you using the ELK for? I saw it there. On yes. The the um, well, we're basically using it so that um, so the diagnostics are really good at picking up when things go wrong, um, but you you want to kind of be able to like run through leading up to that point what have things been like, and that's essentially it's that whole thing of searching through logs. That's really what we're using ELK for. Um, David, I don't know if you want to speak to that point a bit. You've worked quite a bit on the that part of the framework recently. Oh, I get a, I get a microphone. Sorry, David's David Ellison, Dr. Ian David Ellison. Um. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, Oracle is very good at having different systems that respond to different things in different times and different places and different people building on things. Um, and Elk is one of those one of those texts that a lot of the teams have hooked onto. Um, so as part of a diagnostic run, we um, as part of a diagnostic run, we inject or we emit the results of the diagnostic into ELK so that other teams can then add on their own custom alerts. In the same way, we use Grafana um, and kind of all of the backing stuff for Grafana um, to provide um, other mechanisms for teams to hook onto their diagnostics and get results out. Um, so it's just about providing accessibility, and consequently, we also use it for a lot of our logging um, to get our logs out. Um, sorry, <laughs> just wondering: uh, Do you guys have a front-end system? Do you link in with Zabbix? How, how um, do you manage to see what you what your di diagnostics return? That, that is pretty much our front-end system. Um, we, it, it's like halfway scrolled down. We're, we have a lot of sites. Um, but our front-end system is built using Flask. Um, it's that portion up there. Um, and yeah, so it's basically just a Flask app that presents things in nice reports, hides things that people don't want to see. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Uh, do you handle, and then if you do, what do you do with the case when your diagnostics don't return anything, where you don't get, say, the diagnostic fails? Um, so, um, do you mean, like, like if it if it reaches the timeout without returning something, oh, or if it crashes yeah. in the middle of? There's an error in the diagnostic code. Yes, or yeah, yeah. Like that. So if there's a framework failure or if there's a timeout or something, that's all handled elsewhere in the framework. Um, but essentially, we return the instead of a. I think you saw. Okay. Ah, there. Um, there you saw the these health statuses. Um, we also have timeout as a status and um, failure or failed and that's essentially what we return there. It's just, it's not, they're not considered health classes there because we don't want people to be returning timeout as part of their diagnostic. That's, we do that. No one else. <laughs> as part of a failed diagnostic, we will emit the, we, we do emit things like the stack trace. Um, so that the person that wrote the diagnostic will know, okay, my, my, my script timed out, and this is wh where it timed out, why it timed out, or if there's a framework exception, which is generally something that is our fault, um, we can then see, okay, it failed in this way, and this is the stack trace, and we can see it. Um, and that gets, pop that gets percolated from the nodes themselves, running the collector, all the way up the various different um, 
the various different stages to our kind of production, uh, to our dashboards so that we can see the results at. Cool. Any other one else? Um, I just have one question myself. Uh, what are some of the like really good wins you've had from actually having this deployed in production? Um, I see. I'm very new at this, giving talks about like corporateness at public events. So I'm not sure which kinds of errors. Um, we can talk about. I do, like one example would, that comes to mind that I can kind of talk about in broad terms is Ustree's team is our continuous integration team. Um, and they've recently started, um, there was an issue that was coming up where, yeah, I don't know, David, if I can talk about it or not. But essentially they've piggybacked on our system to because we, can, because we can automatically pick it up, they've piggybacked on it to automatically be able to remediate it. So we no longer get paged for those issues, which is a big win. I, I also have another good win for us, which I think was um, quite, quite nice in, in terms of kind of Oracle Cloud. Um, Oracle moves at a glacially slow pace. Um, getting something deployed can take upwards of six months through our various different QA cycles. If we write something in our, con in our kind of control plane, kind of instance lifecycle stuff, it can take a very long time to get onto the production fleet. Um, our project is the first one kind of within our fleet where we have a kind of time to production in a good case of less than a week because we've been able to, ma we've been able to convince QA, upper management, the VPs, that the way in which we've architected all of this, um, and Python's really helped a lot with that, the way in which we've architected it is good enough that we can kind of get it onto production quickly so we can diagnose those issues and get our results out. Um, so and I think that for us is a good win. Yeah, and a kind of critical component of that is the fact that we're not messing with like our core product. And, like all, our, all the services that our customers depend on we're not interfering with that kind of thing, so we can do that. Um, cool. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron. Cool. Um, as every PyCon member has ever experienced, we are behind schedule as per normal. So T will run up until 11.35, and then the next session will start. And we're done. Yeah. So enjoy T. It should be just outside these doors. Um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions about other stuff we do, I think... Yeah, Yusri, David, Peter, Tato's there, uh, Melissa, Nasli, can more than welcome to come talk to us afterwards. We don't have a stand this year, I'm sorry.